Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is McCoy Smith from Portland, Oregon in the United States. I'm here to talk about patents. Specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of patents in the United States and its impact on free and open source software, as well as doing a little bit of prediction of where the future may hold and things that may need to be done as a result of the developments over the years. First of all, I got to start with a legal disclaimer, a bit tongue in cheek. I am a United States lawyer. I'm also a United States patent lawyer and a Canadian patent agent, but I am not your lawyer, which means if you have questions about legal problems or issues or patents or any other topic, please consult with your own lawyer. Uh, I have also simplified a lot of concepts here, uh, compressed timelines, et cetera, for the ease of this presentation to make the points clearer. Given the time limits that we have of the half hour here, I kind of had, that, had to do that. Please don't quibble if uh, I didn't get the facts exactly the way that you think they are. It could be just because I did, I compressed things for the ease of presentation. So first I'd like to start talking a little bit about the history of patent law in the United States and how it relates to open source software. Uh, starting with a brief early history of software and patents, uh, many people think that patents and software really only came into being in the 90s. That is completely incorrect. In fact, software patents predate software copyrights in terms of the first filings of those two forms of intellectual property related to software. Um, software patents really only got their first test in the 70s uh, in the United States courts. There's a ca case called Gottschalk v. Benson, which is really the kind of the first patent-ish uh, case related to software. Uh, in that case, the Supreme Court in the United States found that this specific patent was related to an abstract idea. It was not patentable. But a few years later, in a se separate case, Diamond v. Deere, we had the United States Supreme Court first validate that one could pursue a patent related to software and that it wasn't abstract in a way that made it ineligible for patenting. Now, that doesn't mean that in 1981 was the first time a patent was ever valid or issued in the United States. As I mentioned before, since the 60s, people have been filing software patents and there were in fact many thousands of software related patents in the United States before the 1980s. There was a development in the 1990s, a case called State Street Bank, which really uh, most people think of as opening the uh, US patent system to software patents, but they were not first allowed then. It was actually much earlier than that. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of uh, free and open source software licensing and patents. Um, the earliest uh, free and open source software licenses, the BSD and the MIT, uh, have a degree of ambiguity about the patent rights conveyed using them. And there continues to be a debate about this issue to this day, nearly 40 years after those licenses were first drafted. I've provided in the materials links to a couple of articles published within the past three years in which there have been debates about the scope of patent grants in BSD and MIT. They're worth reading if you're interested in this topic. But um, in the 90s, much more careful FOSS patent licensing started to develop and you saw the newer licenses have much more clear and explicit language around the patent rights that were conveyed anytime you use one of those licenses. So most of the more popular newer licenses, Apache, Mozilla, Eclipse, and GPLv3 all have patent language in them. Now, one way to look at the problem or the issue of patents in free and open source software is to divide the sort of patent holding players into different types. And here is an example in my mind of how a good way of looking at that. So on the far left, you have participants in an OSS project who uh, practice or have products as well as own patents. On the far right, you will have a entity that practices and has products as well as patents, but they may not be a participant in a particular uh, open source project 
under a particular license. And then in the center bottom, you have entities who don't have any particular product or business other than owning patents. They simply own patents for the purpose of asserting those patents and collecting royalties. As I discussed before, uh, many of the newer open source licenses include express patent language about the patent rights that are conveyed. The older ones, there's a debate about the degree of patent rights that are conveyed. But in the, the group of companies that own patents and who participate in an OSS project, um, many of the patent issues are dealt with by the license itself. So the patent grant and the OSI approved license, because those companies are participating in that project, they will have conveyed some degree of patent rights to the project. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about patent pledges. So this was something that was quite in vogue in the early 2000s, where you had a number of different uh, patent holding companies make various statements about their non-desire to assert their patents against some form of free and open source software. Uh, Red Hat and IBM are two examples of companies that did that, but there were many more throughout the technology industry that did this in the early 2000s. Um, this was mainly done because there was considered to be a patent threat to significant open source projects like Linux. And these companies wanted to get out front and say, by the way, we're, we're not interested in inserting our patent rights against these projects or other forms of open source software. There was also a coordinated efforts within the industry to get together and make uh, agreements amongst industry players that they collectively would not make patent assertions against certain types of free and open source software. And the two best examples of that is the Open Invention Network, which uh, the members of that make a pledge not to assert their patents against something called the Linux system definition. There's a smaller organization called PAX, which makes a similar uh, pact amongst the participants that they won't assert patents against Android. So if you look at our charts of patent holding entities, the, pledge, the various forms of pledges that were made by patents include both the participants in open source projects who own patents, as well as potentially companies who are non-participants in those projects, but nevertheless want to make some sort of pledge that they will not assert patents against them. So as you can see here, goes. Now there's another restraint against using patents, which uh, although it's not discussed a lot, I think it very much is in play and I, can, I, I call that good community citizenship. So, you know, there are many, many companies in the technology industry these days who in some way either participate in or rely on free and open source software as part of their products, as part of their services, or part, as part of their business. And uh, many of them, I think, have come to realize that it would be highly detrimental to those businesses if they were to start asserting patents against free and open source software in general. So many of them, I think, are constrained and don't assert patents because they know it would be harmful to their own businesses that rely on free and open source software. Um, there can also be a, de a degree of developer pressure in this. Um, I think that many companies feel that when, if and when they start making patent assertions against free and open source software, they're gonna have a very hard time getting developer cooperation on the projects that are important to them. So for example, will the developer community um, allow or be helpful in getting their contributions upstream if they are perceived to be a patent threat? I think that's probably a concern that many companies have and a reason why they don't assert patents. Another constraint is something that the Open Invention Network does, which is the de their defensive patent portfolio, which is advertised as being designed as something that may be asserted against an entity that asserts its own patents against free and open source software. That's never, as far as I know, been done, but it is a potential constraint. 
So as I said, good community citizenship, it's something that I think does constrain patent assertions, both by companies that are participating in a particular project or who those companies that don't participate but otherwise rely on those projects. And that may also serve as a form of constraint against patent assertions that sort of fills up this pie of the potential threat of patents against free and open source projects. Another interesting constraint here, and this is something you've somewhat seen bear out historically, is that many of the fights that involve patents and are in some way related to free and open source software are really two large companies fighting against one another over um, businesses or products that they compete with one another on. Uh, Oracle at versus Google is a good example of that. Everybody thinks of that as a software API case, and that's the case that's up in front of the Supreme Court right now. But there were also some patent claims in them that got dismissed fairly early in the case. There are other cases of that sort. But in many cases, you will see free and open source software be part of a patent litigation between two big companies. But these disputes don't tend to spill over into the broader ecosystem of those free and open source software packages. It's just a fight between two big companies posturing against one another and using patents as part of that fight. So the family fights between two big companies or bigger companies against one another is another, tends to be a bit of a constraint against patent assertions against the larger ecosystem. So as you can see here, I'm starting to fill in a lot of the patent, potential patent assertions in two categories of patent holders. Those companies that do participate in a particular project and those companies that may not participate in a particular uh, project, but otherwise have businesses that are impacted by patent assertions or businesses that are dependent on free and open source software. And as you can probably surmise from the way that I put these charts together, there is a big glaring hole here. And that's the one I've highlighted in this slide, which is the companies that really don't have any business other than owning patents and asserting patents. Um, those companies really aren't constrained by any of the historical constraints against patent assertions versus free and open source software. So the entities, the non-practicing entity, entities, or sometimes often called pejoratively patent trolls, are the entities that really don't have any businesses other than owning patents and asserting patents. They don't really ever rely upon or care about free and open source software. They're just there to monetize the patent assets that they hold. Now there is one slight constraint against these companies and it's a relatively new development called the License on Transfer Network. And this is a large group of companies that have banded together and have pledged to one another that if they sell a patent from their patent portfolio to an entity that has no business other than asserting patents, then everybody who participates in that organization automatically gets a license to that patent. So in other words, it's sort of an anti-non-practicing non entity uh, agreement to prevent the sale of patents to uh, entities that may use them merely for monetization. So this can be somewhat of a constraint against these non-practicing entities. The problem is most non-practicing entities are not gonna be in the market for patents that are encumbered by the license on transfer pledge. They're really looking to either develop their own patents or to buy them on the market where there is no such encumbrance against the patent rights. You can see here the non-practicing entities, there may be a little bit of constraint against asserting patents against free and open source software due to the license on transfer network, but for the most part it isn't dealing with many of the patents that these entities hold. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the more recent history of patent, uh, patents and software patents. Um, there have been a number of cases in the past 10 years 
that have tried to deal with the extent to which patents directed to software ought to be patentable in the first place. I've listed a bunch of the cases here and I have links in the materials. They're not worth going through other than to say that the courts have struggled with to what extent a patent directed to software actually can be granted. They actually have invalidated a number of software patents, but they haven't invalidated them all. And there are some cases through the appeals courts in the United States where software patents are being validated as patentable. Uh, this has also led to many patent lawyers adjusting the way they present their claims and the patent document itself so that it will, test, it, it will pass these tests that have been set up by the courts. And that has been sort of borne out by uh, data from the patent offices, which show that software patents have been increasing in volume year over year over the past decade to decade and a half. There's also a very recent case last month or actually two months ago that is again testing the boundaries of this idea of what is or isn't abstract and what is or isn't patentable. It's called American Axel. And that may be headed to the Supreme Court so we may get yet another analysis of this issue that may bear upon a software patent uh, eligibility. So now I want to talk a little bit about the history of challenging patents that may constitute a threat to free and open source software. I've listed here a number of initiatives that were launched primarily in the early to mid 2000s that were designed to either create prior art that could be used against uh, threatening software patents that were potentially going to be asserted against FOSS or to actually go out and try to invalidate these patents. Um, a lot of this activity was reactive, essentially attempting to uh, react to patents that already existed or were perceived as a threat. They weren't particularly proactive. A lot of them also have become inactive. Um, there have been successful challenges to patent rel patents relative to software by some of these entities over the years, but they've been fairly limited over 15 years. Okay, so that's a little bit of the history. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my perception of the future in this area. As I mentioned before, I think, I think the biggest glaring hole that is a pro potential problem for free and open source software going forward in the future is these non-practicing entities who amass patents, have no business other than asserting the patents, and are looking to gain royalties through assertions or the request for licenses to those patents. Now, for a very long time, we did not see a whole lot of activity around these non-practicing entities against free and open source software. That was mainly because they were tending to want to chase the for-profit products of large companies because they saw that that was the best place to get royalties. Uh, they also probably perceived free and open source software as something that was given away for free or without royalty, and therefore there was going to be a hard time asking for money for something like that. But we have seen very recently some activity that may indicate that that mindset has gone away. Uh, a lot of people may be familiar with the assertion against Gnome by uh, an entity called the Rothschild. There's also another entity called Soundview that's going out and make uh, asserting uh, patents against companies. Some of these patents are said to be directed to open source packages such as Hadoop. Now, in the case of these companies or these entities, non-practicing entities, the only real vehicle you've got to deal with them is to challenge their patents because they're not gonna sign up for a pledge they're not going to uh, execute or participate in a project and therefore commit their patents under an open source license. They're really just looking to monetize a patent asset that they hold. Now, it, it is possible that's one of the reasons why the GNOME litigation was settled. There was a fairly strong statement at the beginning of this, that 
litigation by the Gnome Foundation, that they were prepared to challenge those patent, the patent that was being asserted. And there was an entity called Unified Patents that put out a competition to gather prior art. So there was a strong position that was given in that litigation that the patents would be challenged. And that may have been a factor and resulted in the settlement in that case and the license that was granted in that case to all software under a free and sor open source software license. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about how you do go about challenging patents. There's three main v ways of challenging a patent in the United States for validity. Uh, the first is whether it's eligible be to be patented in the first place. And in the case of software, that challenge is essentially whether or not the subject matter being pursued in the patent is quote unquote abstract under the various tests that the courts have set out in the United States. There are other tests that can be done and these are based on prior art. Either is it novel, so is it identical to a piece of prior art that existed before the patent or something called obviousness in the United States, an inventive step in Europe and other countries essentially based on the prior art that existed before the patent, is it merely an obvious extension of that? Talk a little bit about where you can challenge a patent. The first and the most legislature to make them not eligible for patenting. There was a time in the early 2000s where people thought that they had a chance of convincing various legislatures, including the EU, to uh, make software patents ineligible, but that has gone kind of by the wayside. And I don't think there's any potential for any legis major legislature in the, in the world to say that patents on software will never be eligible for patenting. Which means there are a couple of other ways that you wind up having to challenge patents. One is in the US court system, in the US is the federal court system. It's invalid, please invalidate it. That's not enough in the United States. And in the courts in the, in the United States, you can challenge a patent on any basis. It could be prior art, it could be abstraction, it could be any, any many other ways. Of course, the problem with the US court system, it is very expensive. So most patent litigation in the United States is gonna cost millions of dollars to resolve if we take it all the way to the end. Now, the cheaper and uh, potentially easier way to challenge a patent is through the United States Patent Office. And there are a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, there's a new procedure that's only been around for about 10 years called Interparties Review. You've probably heard of this, IPR. Um, if you want to do that, you have to do it based on prior art. So you can't challenge something based on being a software patent based on it being abstract cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, so they're not entirely cheap, but they can be cheaper than having to go through the court system in the United States. There's also a challenge called post-grant review. Again, that's also been in place only within the past 10 years or so. And in that case, you can challenge for any basis of validity. So it can be prior art, it can be that the claims are abstract. The problem with this is you have to file them very early. It's gotta be within nine months of the patent being granted. These sorts of challenges also potentially can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a, another form of challenge that is actually quite cheaper. It's only tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's called re-examination. Again, that can only be done based on prior art. You can file it at any time, but unfortunately it's a very one-sided procedure. You, basically going to get one chance to make your claim that the patent is invalid. So now I'm going to do a little bit of prediction here or, or a projection of what I think uh, probably people ought to be thinking more strongly about, which is what should we do in the case here of patents that be, are being asserted against free and open source software. And I've broken this down into best, middle, and worst case. So the best case here is, um, if that's the case, then what has been done so far is probably sufficient. You deal on assertions like a gnome on a case-by-case -case basis, and you don't have to have a comprehensive policy to deal with these problems. Now, the medium case scenario is you've got a few large practicing patent holders that remain threats. So either, in, I think if that's the case, there may be a need to revive and or redo the various initiatives that were instituted in the early 2000s 
to deal with uh, patents that were held by non-practicing entities, ones that were either designed to develop prior art against those patents or ones that were designed to actively file challenges to those patents, either in the court system or through the patent office. And finally, the worst case scenario is rather than having the practicing ent patent holder entities uh, generally leave FOSS alone, you start to see them being more active in asserting patents against FOSS. You also see the non-practicing patent holders ramp up. So they start to see free and open source software because it's so ubiquitous and used by so many different companies as a prime target for their assertions of their patents in order to gain royalty. In that case, if that's the worst case or we develop the worst case scenario, I think there's probably going to be the need to develop a new industry-sponsored and highly funded entity whose sole purpose is to develop prior art, find prior art, find patents that are held by entities that may represent a threat to FOSS and to take aggressive uh, action against those patents to do what they can to in invalidate or narrow the scope of those patents. Mind to a lot of people, well, I'm not a lawyer. What, what actually can I do to help, in, to help address this problem? And there really are a couple of things that you can do. Number one is the more prior art there is out there, the easier it's going to be to challenge these sorts of patents. And the way prior art is created is by documentation of new developments in technology, publishing those developments in a, in a way where one can be certain of the date when that was published. Another way that you can help is help to locate prior art when there is a need for it. There is a bounty program that has been done by, for example, Unified Patents. They offered a bounty for good prior art against the Rothschild patent that was asserted against GNOME. Look out for that and see when you see them announcing bounty programs for prior art that are directed to patents relevant to free and open source software. There may be some money in it for you and you may help develop a defensive case against a patent that's a problem to free and open source software. And finally, one thing to be aware of is the political end of these things. There's a thing called the Inventors' Rights Act of 2019 that was introduced last year. It would help to monitor that, and if you feel like you want to be political, let your representative know, if you are in the U.S., your feelings about this sort of thing. Okay, so that's basically the presentation uh, I'm going to put a little plug in for a book that's going to be coming out uh, early next year from Oxford, Oxford University Press, author or co-author on, on a couple of chapters on this, including the patent chapter. If you want more detailed information on these subjects, think about purchasing this book when it comes out next year. So that's the end of the presentation, and I think we'll open it up live now for questions from the Corporate audience. Or industrial interests who might be willing, or the criteria for characteristics of organizations who might be willing to fund the sort of large, proactive, uh, all vectors attacks on patents against FOSS? Um, yeah, I, I think the problem is that most organizations have kind of done their own things. I mean, OIN is sort of a unified thing, but they haven't really been all that active in doing the sort of things that I talked about, which is actually aggressively going out and challenging patents. Um, OIN might be a good vehicle for that or something like OIN, which is really designed to be a patent attack entity uh, is something that I think may be needed in the future if, if things go the wrong way. So, so what I'm guessing is that the uh, the driver for your worst case scenario would be precisely that, 
rather than being seeing as a sort of non-commercial hobbyist activity, uh, trying oh, yeah. to begin to recognize that it's the world's biggest, most valuable companies, and it's it's like five of the world's five most valuable companies now are massive users of open source. And right. so uh, I take your point about they've already got their own protections in place, but very few of those protections are effective against the fully isolated non-practicing entities. There's, there's no right. way to cross-license, there's no way to do anything. So it's it would seem that there might be an interest there to uh, to pursue either on a consulting basis, so let, them, let the really big guys do it company by company, but certainly the mid-tier, the next sort of 100 companies who are vulnerable to this may not wish to specialise, may not wish to spend their executive bandwidth, uh, but might be willing to fund an external specialist centre. I, I don't know if concrete suggestions just occurs to me there's an economic argument that this thing must exist. It's, it's like how to find it is a different question, of course. Yeah, I, I think I think what what needs to happen is there needs to be more of a perceived threat than there currently is. I mean, if if you just have an Ono Gnome case every five years, then it's probably not perceived that that patent assertion entities are all that big of a problem, and they'll deal with those on a case by case basis. If oh, and, and sure, right? It, you're just the the response to the to the threat. It's I'm talking about what happens right. if you're your worst case scenario comes true. Um, is, is there, have you thought about what that path, what the way of recruiting large deep pocketed partners might look like? Because of course that's, the, yes, it's only that situation that the question arises. Uh, well, you know, one way of doing that is making a presentation at state of the source and have people go back to their employers and say, hey, I heard a very interesting presentation. You ever thought about this idea? <laughs> Hooray. I know a guy who's thinking about it. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so somebody asks, you and I spoke a few years ago at the same 5G event. Uh, any room for FOSS in that patent infested thicket? Uh, this is a, a slightly different issue, I think which is the uh, development of open source software within standard setting bodies that have a royalty collection patent licensing scheme. And that's yet another complex issue where you have competing interests amongst the large commercial companies, some of whom want to preserve as best as possible their patent, patent royalty collection vehicles on standards that they have created and others arguing that that's fine but you can't do that around the open source again this is there's a debate that's been going on for at least five years and has not really been resolved 